Guten Abend, meine Damen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good evening. I'm very happy to see so many of you. My name is Peter Limburg, and we have, I believe, a very exciting discussion ahead of us. A discussion that will cover a very broad field, the question of open borders, whether they are unavoidable or unnecessary, and what risks do they imply. I think we have a very interesting and diverse panel with us today, this evening, at the Open Forum. But before I introduce the ladies and gentlemen on the panel, I think all of the Swiss uh, people here will know the lady. Um, I should say that uh, two-thirds of this discussion time will be dedicated to uh, questions from you. So please think about uh, what questions you would uh, wish to raise, and please uh, identify yourself clearly if you do wish to raise a question. I'm very happy for us to have the President of the Swiss Confederation with us this evening, and I'm very happy that the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Mr. Guterres, is here, uh, the German uh, Interior Minister, Thomas de Mazier, and uh, Mr. Sorensen, the voice of uh, the business sector. He's from Marriott, uh, the very well-known hotel chain, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. A question that's been discussed a great deal in Europe, it's a burning issue, that is the question of open borders. Many different aspects to that question. And as a representative of Deutsche Welle, a broadcaster, uh, which brought our broadcast to the world, I am a great advocate of open borders to information, but there are other issues as well, monetary, business, economic, political. And the question is, how do people respond to open borders? That has to be taken into account. Uh, there are also questions of law and order and safety and security that we need to bear in mind. Um, but certainly the humanitarian disasters which we've seen in Syria and other parts of the world will cast a shadow over this discussion. I'd like to ask the UN High Commissioner for Refugees to give an outline of how the refugee situation has developed recently and where we stand. Well, thank you very much. I think that we are living a, a period in which, uh, for the first time since the Second World War, we have more than 50 million people displaced by conflict in the world. Of these 50 million people displaced by conflict in the world, about 16 to 17 million, we have not yet the statistics for the end of last year, have crossed borders, are uh, as refugees in other countries, and 90% of them are in the developing world. But more staggering than this number is the enormous acceleration in the recent past. In 2011, 14,000 people were displaced by conflict per day in the world, internally and externally. In 2012, 23,000. In 2013, 32,000. Which means that the world has lost capacity to prevent conflicts, to solve conflicts, and because of that, we are having more and more people forced to flee because of conflict, independently of all the other reasons that make people move in the world. Now, obviously, being uh, High Commissioner for Refugees, taking into account that 90% of the refugees are in the developing world, there are two questions that are absolutely essential for us. The first question is massive support to the countries that are hosting them, to the Lebanons, the Jordans, the Cameroons, the uh, Kenyas, the uh, Ethiopians of this world. Massive support in order for them to be able to cope with the enormous challenge that the presence of, a such, number of such a large number of refugees represents. In Lebanon today, one third of the population is Syrian and Palestinian. You can imagine what that means. And the second appeal we make is for borders outside the neighbor areas to be open to refugees. Of course, when we say borders should be open, that doesn't mean borders should not be managed. Borders need to be opened and to be managed. States have the right to define their own migration policies and to manage their borders according to the way they define their migration policies. States have the right and the need to protect the security of their citizens. And in the management of the borders, needs, this needs to be taken into account. But it is also essential that those in need of protection have access to territories where they can find protection. 
And to be honest, it breaks my heart to see thousands and thousands of Syrians crossing the Mediterranean, putting themselves into the hands of smugglers and traffickers that are international criminals that violate their rights and put their lives at risk, uh, exploit them in an absolutely uh, horrible way. It breaks my heart to see that many of them are doing that because they do not find a legal way to come into Europe. And that is why it is so important uh, that countries like Germany uh, have uh, uh, had uh, extremely meaningful programs, both in direct asylum to Syrians, uh, but also in humanitarian admission and resettlement, uh, and in facilitating family reunification, in having uh, flexible visa policies, because if we want to fight irregular movements of people, we need to do many things to crack down on smuggling and trafficking, to support areas of origin, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing that we also need to do um, is to create more legal avenues for people to be able to move and at the same time to manage the borders in a protection sensitive way for those that are in need of protection, those that are fleeing conflict or persecution to have access to the territories where they can feel safe. Thank you for the moment. Um, Frau Bundespräsidentin. Madam President. Switzerland has a long tradition of receiving refugees. Uh, we've just heard the figures, uh, for example, relating to Lebanon. A third or a quarter of the population, depending on how you count it, is currently made up of refugees. Unimaginable, that figure for countries in Europe. Shouldn't Europe really step in in light of the situation and open its borders to more refugees? Yes, I'm very happy uh, for the fact that UN High Commissioner has recalled the fact that 90% of refugees stay in the area of origin in the neighbor of states. I um, visited Jordan last year, a country with almost as many uh, inhabitants of Switzerland, a million Syrian uh, refugees, um, huge camps, but not only in camps. They move in uh, Jordan. They look for work. This kid, their kids have to go to school. So I think our policy has to be coherent with what the UN High Commission has said, namely that we need to support those countries that are most directly and most strongly affected by the flows of refugees. Now, I spoke with Syrian refugees in Jordan. I said to them, how does the future look to you? And they all said, without exception, we want to go home. We have this impression in Europe that everybody wants to come to us. But in fact, what they really want to do is stay at home or be able to go home, or at least stay in the region. And if they want to go far, uh, that is because they are either in danger in those neighboring states or they don't uh, receive the medical attention that they re require or that they're traumatized and they cannot stay in a refugee camp or that they have family in Europe or in Switzerland. But the view that everybody wants to come to Europe is simply wrong. And that's why in Switzerland and in Europe, we have the policy where we say what's most important is help locally. We need to support these countries. Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey have huge requirements to meet the uh, refugees who are coming to them. I've visited schools in Jordan where Switzerland is supporting school projects so that uh, Jordanian children can go to school in the morning and the Syrian children in the afternoon. There's a scarcity of water in Jordan and with a million extra refugees, that exacerbates that problem. So we are developing infrastructure projects there as well. So that's just one side of things. I think local help is essential. The other side is that we have people coming to us. Uh, they need protection perhaps, they have family perhaps, and I'm very happy to have hear, heard you, Mr. Guterres, say that borders need to be managed. Yes, they are there to guarantee our safety, but they also need to be opened so that those people who require protection can, can receive it. That's a huge challenge to um, 
any state or the Schengen area as a whole. We have to face up to that challenge and respond to it. And in terms of security issues, yes, we need to respond uh, with intelligent discussion. We mustn't forget, however, that there are many people who require our protection, and therefore we can't close our borders to them. They need to be open, these borders, but also managed in such a way that they do guarantee our safety. Uh, and there, and we need to ensure that we are therefore supervising the people who come. Before we come to the question of uh, law and order, uh, may I ask you, Mr. de Mezia, about the quantity of refugees coming to Germany, over 200,000 in the last year. What does that mean? That's a significant increase. What does that mean for a country like Germany? Well, the subject for discussion is this evening open borders and avoidable or unnecessary. Well, I think that open borders are necessary. We need uh, to ensure that they are managed, but it, it would be f foolish to believe that in principle borders can be fully open in principle in uh, the world in which we live. We have made significant achievements within the European Union and in the Schengen area we do have open borders within that area. Uh, that sometimes leads to problem itself, but that's another question. But opening borders has been achieved in that area uh, with a certain sacrifice of national sovereignty. We also have visa-free travel, and I'm sure that uh, Mr. Sorensen will pick up on the importance of that. Uh, we have to distinguish, however, between visa-free travel and uh, choice of where people actually decide to settle. But we're talking about uh, refugees. Mr. Guterres mentioned resettlement programs. And what's important for that is not so much open borders, but that we recognize our humanitarian responsibility and allow certain people to come to our countries. Uh, we take around 90% of the refugees from Syria who are outside the region. Uh, we have taken or accepted around uh, 90,000 since the beginning of the uh, war in Syria. Now, it's little in comparison to uh, Jordan or other countries in the region, Lebanon, uh, but it's quite a lot in comparison to other European countries, some of them, some of which are large. Uh, the problem is that we are constrained by our geographical situation, uh, the um, Schengen uh, area as well. And we have people coming because of these op significantly open borders that simply come to Germany or Europe in search of a more prosperous life, which is something that we fully understand. Of the 200,000 uh, asylum requests that we received in Germany in 2014, we saw that that was the largest number for many years, but less, it must be remembered, than in the 1990s, where we had 400,000. Of these 200,000, 60,000 came from the West Balkans. Uh, the largest country of those was uh, Serbia. Serbia has been um, on the path to joining the European Union. Um, there are democratic elections there. There are differences in uh, quality of uh, standards of living. Uh, there is discrimination, perhaps. There might be questions of ethical issues with the Roma, but um, there is no persecution. So the question here is whether or not uh, we allow people in from those regions under the definition of asylum. Uh, What we need to do is say, you cannot use uh, your situation as a reason for requesting asylum. Uh, poverty is not 
or a reason for requesting asylum. And therefore, we deny these people asylum, or if they are in Germany, we refuse them residence. At the same time, we need to recognize that there are legitimate reasons for asylum, and we can only pursue that policy effectively um, if there is the support of the population as a whole. Now, in Germany, there are many different strands of opinion from full rejection to um, the desire to help and receive more refugees. I'd like to ask Mr. Sorensen, what is the role of business in the area of open borders and in this question? Perhaps not so much in terms of tourism, uh, because we're talking about refugees. To what extent can business make a contribution? Or would you say that's purely a matter for the government to deal with? We don't have anything to do with it. Danke. Uh, guten Abend, Jemann. Uh, I apologize for not being able to answer in German, so I've just exhausted my German. Um, I also will confess right up front that being on the stage with these uh, um, auspicious government officials who are wrestling with very fundamental issues, uh, I sometimes wonder why I'm here being uh, simply a hotel person. Um, but let me, let me sort of talk a little bit about the way we see people move. Uh, on, and this is an oversimplification to be, be sure. But on some level, refugees are running from something. They may be running from war. They may be running from persecution. They may be running from uh, a natural disaster of, of one sort or another. Uh, and those are obviously very fundamental stories and a need for the UNHCR and business and governments to uh, respond in a humanitarian way. And I think in many respects, all of us believe that in those instances, uh, the interests of an individual nation probably take second fiddle and the first, uh, take second uh, order of priority. And the first order of priority is to make sure that the humanitarian crisis is met with humanitarian aid and resolution. A second sort of travel is people who are traveling to something. Now, sometimes the lines between these two categories are a little bit fuzzy, uh, but they may be moving as migrants, as immigrants, uh, to a place where there is a, a sense of greater opportunity. Uh, and I think as the, the uh, commissioner for the uh, uh, UN said, uh, I think it is given that most individual countries get to make a decision about whether to accept immigrants or not. Uh, and those uh, political discussions within countries, uh, including in the United States today and in many countries in Europe, are often very controversial and there are very strong views that go in both directions. But there is a powerful force of uh, hundreds of millions of people who are looking to move across national borders in order to pursue greater opportunity. Uh, and while uh, that political debate within a given nation is extremely important. It's also, I think, important to recognize that some of those people will move no matter what individual states decide. They may move with a uh, human smuggler. They may move by trying to cross borders illegally. Uh, but there will be movement that occurs. Uh, and clearly, uh, countries need to figure out how to control their borders in order to address those risks in the way they, they think are most important. A third form of human movement uh, is travel, uh, a temporary travel. Uh, and uh, that runs a gamut. Sometimes we think of it as not being terribly important. And it certainly is not as important as responding to the humanitarian need of a refugee. Uh, but there are roughly 10% of all jobs across the globe, on average, uh, that are engaged in serving people who travel not just hotels, but restaurants and airlines and other folks that are broadly involved in this. And people travel for many reasons. They travel to see their families uh, living abroad. Uh, they travel for business purposes in order to engage in commerce, which in turn is also about jobs. Uh, and they travel for vacations. And most people, I think, understand that vacations are things that we all want to do. Uh, and then in this third category of travel as well, uh, it is broadly recognized that it's up to the individual country to determine 
uh, what kind of open border they want to have. Do they want to welcome people to come in and uh, see family, do business, take vacations? Or do they want to essentially have that border closed? As a hotel person, I obviously have a business bias towards uh, relatively more flexibility in terms of people's travel. But again, that is very much an individual nation states uh, decision, uh, and that decision gets made in many different uh, political processes around the world. Uh, ultimately, when we gather here, and you think about the second two categories of travel, you think about uh, people running to something, looking for more opportunity, migration, and you think about travel itself, uh, there, there are many agendas here, but clearly one of them is about information. Uh, do we know whether people are coming across the border illegally? Do we know whether they're staying longer than their visa permits them to? Uh, and uh, there, are lots, there are lots of sources of information out there. Uh, many of those sources of information are in public hands. Uh, think about the visa process that governments run. You apply for a visa in many countries to go to other countries. Uh, you have citizenship information if you're within, say, the Schengen area in Europe, for example, so there's information there that the government has. Uh, there are also private pools of information. Think about the airlines and the hotel companies as an example. Uh, we know when people are buying airline tickets. We know when people are making hotel reservations. We see their passports usually if they're crossing lines. And I think one of the, the things that we've been discussing here at the Davos uh, uh, WEF meetings is how do we make sure that that information consistent with what we all want in terms of privacy of our own identities. How do we make sure that information is used so that uh, true security risks can be addressed, so that true threats on immigration can be addressed, uh, and so that people can still have as much freedom to move as the decisions of the individual nations essentially allow. Uh, it would be a mistake, I think, for all of us if we said that because of a terrorism event in Paris, all of us in this room would be restrained from taking the next business trip or the next family trip or the next vacation that we wanted to take. Uh, similarly, I think it would be a mistake to say that because there are migrants who want to move uh, to places where countries may want, not want them to come, that that also necessarily means that the globe as a whole should see borders erected and nobody crossed. And that fundamentally is a question about uh, identifying information that can be helpful in allowing countries to solve and address the risks that they want to address, uh, and making sure that we find a way collectively to access that information and to develop policies around how that information can be used so that people's own views about privacy and the rest are, are respected as well. Frau Bundespräsidentin, es gibt ja Madam President, there is the Dublin Treaty, which uh, governs the distribution of refugees throughout Europe and in Switzerland. Do you think it's a fair agreement? Well, the Dublin Treaty doesn't say how they are allocated, but it says who's responsible for an asylum request. And well, would you like to see some kind of uh, allocation? Well, before Dublin, the case was that asylum could be applied for uh, at a number of diff different states. That wasn't a good situation because it wasn't clear who was responsible or the same request was uh, reviewed a number of different times. Uh, so the Dublin Agreement brought order into that situation. Now, the situation at the moment is that six European states with Switzerland uh, take three quarters of asylum seekers. And as the Interior Minister said, there are other European states who hardly receive any asylum seekers. Now, there's an imbalance there. And obviously, that raises the question, how does this happen? Is it because certain countries are more attractive? Is it because certain countries are more geographically attractive, maybe because they're in the Mediterranean uh, region. What does that mean for a common refugee policy if the spread of um, asylum seekers is so uh, imbalanced? What we saw last year was 
Italy's system coming under huge pressure. Thousands of people um, faced unimaginable human drama on the beaches of um, Italy where bodies were arriving, people were, thousands of people were drowning en route. Uh, people who were arriving required medical treatment. They had to be registered under the Dublin Agreement so that the um, responsibilities were clear. Now, ultimately, Italy felt that it couldn't cope with the situation, which led to a certain amount of tension. We must be honest about that. Now, together with Germany, we said to Italy, you have to do or uh, cope with your responsibilities. We need to ensure that um, refugees are registered, asylum seekers are registered, but we are willing to support you because this situation is exceptional and therefore uh, we need to help one another. I think Germany and Switzerland and other European states took this attitude towards Italy and in doing so showed that we are credible. We ask Italy to live up to its commitments, but at the same time we're willing to provide support for that. So this imbalance in the distribution of asylum seekers does require some changes, but I don't think that we can be unrealistic about it. I think um, we need to work hard on this. It will be a long and difficult discussion. Uh, Switzerland, I believe, has a good position because we have made our commitments, we are respecting them, and we will continue to do so, but we expect that from others as well. How, Minister de Mazier, can you ensure that other countries do more so that the burden is shared? Would you introduce some kind of quota system uh, for asylum seekers? We have worked together uh, with the Swiss, uh, and I would support what she said. The Dublin system is uh, working. It clearly allocates responsibilities, and we have uh, recognized that the burden needs to be fairly distributed. Some people have said to us uh, that we benefit from Dublin. Uh, that was what was said initially because we were at the middle, we were in the middle of Europe geographically that uh, it would be the countries on the uh, Mediterranean that would have to carry most of the burden. But what we're seeing is that countries like Germany, Sweden, uh, Switzerland are receiving uh, a large number of refugees, to put it neutrally. We recognize, however, that we have our commitments and responsibilities to live up to. So even where we see or we, we believe that there is uh, no grounds for asylum to be granted, we ensure that everybody is received um, under the same conditions. What I'm worried about is that some countries in the European Union have organized the hosting conditions, if you like, so poorly that there is um, a real incentive for asylum seekers to leave. Now, we've said we want to talk about standards for asylum seekers. Um, we cannot accept a situation where a Swiss court has to be called in to examine the possible return of a family to Italy because it's felt that the conditions the family would be subjected into Italy are not of a decent enough standard. We need to ensure that the conditions that are applied in Europe are decent and uh, uniform. That's going to require work. There is, there's need for improvement. With regard to the distribution and, and ensuring that there isn't an imbalance there. Again, that's not an easy task. Um, but we have thought a great deal about this, and perhaps um, the possibility 
would be a uh, to have a European quota uh, for um, refugees. Maybe Mr. Guterres could talk about that. We're talking um, with the Greek minister about uh, the idea of uh, national quotas, but it's quite possible that Europe uh, could uh, come could uh, come up with that idea of an overall quota which might be a good idea because uh, it would involve everybody um, having the same commitment. Mr. Guterres, what do, you, what do you think about this idea of some kind of European quota? Well, first of all, what is the reality we have today? If you look at the news, the large, uh, uh, probably the large majority of the people seeking asylum in Europe enters Europe through Italy and Greece. But uh, Sweden and Germany have received 46% last year of the, all the U asylum requests in Europe, which means that the European asylum system is highly dysfunctional. For two reasons. First, because the chance to be recognized as a refugee, as Minister de Maziere was explaining, if you ask for asylum, your request needs to be examined. You might be asking for asylum because you really are in need of protection, or you, must be ask, you might be asked for asylum because you think it's the best way to uh, solve a migration problem. Um, and indeed, all European states have mechanisms to detect who's in need of protection and who's not in need of protection, so-called refugee status determination, and at the same time, the attribution of other forms of protection. Now, if you are a Somali, in, uh, and ask for protection in Europe, we have statistics of 2013. Your chances vary from 12 to 92 percent to be recognized as in need of protection. If you are Afghan, between, um, uh, sorry, if you are Somali, between 17 and 97 percent. If you are Afghan, between 11 and 92 percent. Within with, Europe. Within, within Europe. Europe. Within the European Union. We need, I mean, if you are a refugee, you must be completely stupid to ask for asylum in a country where your chance to be recognized is 11%, if you have a country where your chance to be recognized is 92%. So unless we have a system that in which there is transparency and in which there is a, a, a equal treatment for people, and then the integration conditions are more or less acceptable everywhere, uh, what you have is not what Dublin defines, what you have is a system of asylum a la carte. And so I think we need two major efforts in Europe. One is to create conditions for an effective harmonization of asylum policies. And second, every state assuming its responsibilities and then the mechanism of solidarity might just justify it because there are different pressures according to the different origins of where the problems uh, exist. Now, if these two conditions are met, uh, if you have all countries assuming their responsibilities, registration, the refugee status determination, etc., and if there are then mechanisms of solidarity, we don't need, I believe, to go to systems of quotas. I mean, if you go on with the present situation, we might need to do something more drastic to have a more fair share within Europe. But uh, it's also important to understand the needs of the people. I mean, the people in need of protection and what for me is a fundamental need, the need for Europe to remain a continent of asylum for those that seek protection in Europe. Antonio, but for you, that, should, you, should, you should come back to European politics. I would welcome that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> but would you also welcome I've a Europe? My bit. <laughs> <laughs> would you also welcome a European asylum um, common law that uh, you will have one regulation for whole Europe? It's, the question goes to Mr. De Maizière, so that the German asylum rules would be Europeized. Then, the Frage der. Well, the the, the question of. Uh, the common assessment of uh, other countries is something that does need to be dealt with at the, at the European level. Uh, we have discussed the possibility of a um, common uh, foreign security policy. Uh, for many years, we've had common um, police and military in Afghanistan. So it must be possible for us within Europe to assess how dangerous uh, 
what the level of persecution is in certain countries. We have a common foreign security policy, at least in part. So I think it's a, a real central need, and I think uh, the new representative of common foreign security policy is, 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 is working on, on this. We have different standards, all the way from Romania to Sweden, uh, but I ag agree that um, we need to recognize that there is a need in our system where we have uh, social transfers where you have certain levels, high in Germany, low, for example, in, in, in Romania. And we need to recognize that if you get a, um, let's say th that uh, the asylum seekers are looking for benefits, um, how do you deal with that f at a, a cross European level? If you hit a medium level of benefits, then they'd be too high for Romania, too low for living in Germany. So there are many difficult questions. Uh, we have a number of problems, some of which seem extremely difficult, some of which I'm sure we can solve. Switzerland's model at the moment, Madam President, is uh, to try, Switzerland is trying to reduce the uh, asylum seeking process to three months. What approach are you taking and um, are these practices that you feel others can adopt? Yes, what we've decided to do in Switzerland is to overhaul our uh, asylum uh, application process by accelerating that and ensuring um, that we have enhanced legal protection for the asylum seekers. It's important that we be able to look at somebody's case and decide whether the individual requires the protection due to genuine asylum uh, seekers or whether or not they need to return to their countries. We believe it's important to do this quickly because we don't want to drag it out for years. That's bad for the country and bad also for um, the asylum seekers themselves, especially if they have children, for example, if, who've started going to school, started making friends, becoming part of their community. If they have to go home after five years, that's uh, somewhat inhumane. So we see situations where asylum seekers are being lured uh, to Switzerland by criminals who are promising them all kinds of things. We need to make it clear to those people that they won't be accepted. Now, in recent years, we've said uh, within Europe, uh, two other countries, we've said in Balkan countries there isn't political persecution. There are problems, but we've made it clear that people seeking asylum in Switzerland from these countries won't get it. Uh, We've cut the process down significantly and tried to send the signal by making quick decisions uh, that these people cannot find asylum in Switzerland. They've been told, for example, if they sell their house, get all their savings and go to Switzerland, that they will find a home there. It's important. We send a message saying that's simply not true. And we've seen, as a result, asylum requests from these countries drop uh, massively. Now, at the same time, we don't want to uh, people to get the wrong message, but we don't want people to fall for false promises either and uh, fill the pockets of the smugglers who lure them to Switzerland. We have, uh, however, um, made commitments to, for example, supporting the Roma people in some countries supporting the education system, uh, the vocational training system in some countries, so that young people have a positive career path ahead, ahead of them. I think that's the most humane way of approaching it, and it's a long-term approach as well, because people who come to Switzerland seeking asylum need to know that they're not going to be recognized as refugees because they're not being political persecuted. 
and then they go home having wasted the best years of their life without any kind of training. So we're trying to build systems uh, which can turn that around. And we've begun um, to apply this policy. We want to be sure that the asylum seeking process in our country is something that is thoroughly done but is also accelerated for all the reasons I've mentioned. And at the same time, we want to be able to show other countries that that is the right direction to take. If they recognize that, um, then we'll be, we'll be happy to share our experience. Can we learn from that, Mr. de Mazia? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, you might be surprised to hear that we're invited to uh, look at um, what the Swiss were doing, and we accepted. Uh, spent a, a, a few hours looking at what is actually happening. It's a, a process which is underway, and uh, we have seen um, that in a couple of cases it, it certainly worked. Now, in the German lender, we've agreed to establish two groups. Uh, those c people coming from countries such as Syria can go through a very quick process, uh, which um, could take just a few days. And those countries coming from very safe, those uh, uh, seekers coming from very safe countries also could receive a message within a very short period that they don't have any chance of asylum. So what we believe that those two large groups uh, can receive a, an accelerated procedure, but there is also unfortunately a group which is something that's a bit more to handle with an accel accelerated procedure. What I'm talking about are people from countries where it's not really clear whether there's political persecution or not. Afghanistan's an example that's been mentioned. Or we have, for example, hundreds of young Tunisians, uh, Libyans, And the situation there is that um, we face a situation where the passports, for example, are thrown away. Uh, people don't want to be identified, where fingerprints are burst off, are burnt off, rather. Um, people who change the story of where they come from every four years every four weeks, rather, excuse me. So that's not the majority of cases, but that happens. We've also faced the added complication of family members, uh, whether um, asylum seekers do belong to the family that they say they belong to. That's an extremely um, difficult situation. There are many situations where really it's not clear. So if you have countries uh, like companies like Germany, Austria, Sweden, um, it's, I think it's quite legitimate for us to say it's not too much to ask to tell us your name and where you come from. So if there is an incentive there for dishonest behavior, the prospect of being able to stay a long time, um, then that, that raises difficulties. And that also um, adds grist to the mill of those who don't want refugees in Germany. In Germany, in recent months, we've seen a movement uh, which has come into difficulties the last uh, week or so, but it's a clear movement which does influence the image of Germany. I'm talking, of course, about the Pegida movement. What role does that play for you? How does Germany respond to such a movement? Um, are you trying to exclude that movement from the political process, or what, what, is, what is your um, approach? Well, it's, it's not a problem which is solely related to Germany. I mean, it's um, a problem we see throughout Europe. Some of them are in Parliament. Mr. Wilders in uh, Holland, uh, the success of UKIP in the European elections in the UK. Uh, Le Pen or Grillo in France and Italy. We haven't seen that in Germany to date, and now we have. 
Now, some people say you don't need to worry. It's just part of becoming a normal European country. But I don't really want to settle um, with that approach. I think we do need to take it very seriously. Now, I don't want to go into it in too great a depth, uh, but the Pegeda movement is saying they don't have anything against refugees per se, but uh, they, the arrival of refugees might lead to resentment and have a negative effect. The question of asylum seekers, refugees, is, is more of a um, symbol for other questions in the context of globalization. Uh, what's happening to Germany in, in a globalized world? Uh, why are we sending soldiers uh, abroad? Wouldn't it be nicer if we didn't have to do that? Wouldn't it be nicer to simply export BMWs to the rest of the world and not have to let the world's problems into Germany? Wouldn't that be nice if people, if, if we could do that? And the answer has to be no. Uh, we have to recognize that there are problems which affect Germany and we have to participate. It would be terrible um, if the refugee problem became worse because of uh, Germany's failure to participate locally. And there would be a knock-on effect for us. It would give us sleepless nights. We've tried different approaches with political pressure, uh, with a lot of money, with not so much money, with soldiers, without soldiers. And we're seeing that the results aren't getting better, getting worse in some cases. But we cannot stop uh, making an effort. And the question, the other question, which is perhaps related to Big is not so much related to refugees. It's a question of religion and culture. And the, this whole issue of open borders obviously brings in this question of culture and religion. Do we believe that the refugees that are coming to our country in speech marks fit in? Do we believe that they have a higher level of criminality than average? Do we believe that they in some way threaten our children? Or do we not believe that? I think you have to consider these issues when you're dealing with a movement like Pegida. So the question about cultural differences, the questions about religion, uh, need to be raised. The discussion needs to be aired. And I believe that this is something that has been subject to taboo for too long in Germany. Uh, three very brief observations. First, when can be a refugee without political persecution? We have more and more situations in the world where persecution is done for other kinds of reasons. For instance, women victims of genital mutilation. Uh, for instance, uh, we are seeing now the, the difficulty uh, that uh, the LGBTI group of population are suffering in many countries. So there are good reasons to grant protection to people, even if they come from countries where there is a democracy, if the countries are not able to protect them against these other forms of persecution, that can be cultural, can be even family, can be uh, of the society, if, as I said, the government is not able to protect them. But it's very important to keep this in mind, that there are today many people seeking uh, refuge in Europe, and rightly so, not because they are politically persecuted, but because they are victims of this kind of situations. Second observation that I think is very important. Uh, we need to be able to understand that most of the attitudes in relation to asylum are because of the debate about migration. And many people do not distinguish the two things. Uh, and what is true is, if I may, um, uh, um, uh, sometimes there is a schizophrenic debate about migration in Europe. I mean, uh, I, I remember seeing a, a survey in which there were three questions. Do you want to have more children? The answer was no. Are you ready to clean the toilets of the restaurant next door? The answer was no. Do you want migrants? The answer was no. And it is obvious that these three answers do not make sense. Uh, if we have, as in my country, an index of fertility of 1.3, when I go to visit my mother, that is 91 years old, and there's permanently a person to assist her, independently of the family, uh, I go there in the weekends when I can. I've never seen a Portuguese there, and Portugal is not a rich country, and we have uh, huge unemployment. It is obvious that Europe cannot, cannot sustain its, uh, its economy and its society without migration. It is also obvious that this needs to be properly managed. 
but sometimes the debate becomes irrational. And this is where I believe it's very important to, to fight the battle of values and principles, which sometimes is absent. Uh, if I think there is something we should all be proud uh, in relation to Europe's contribution to world civilization are the values of the Enlightenment. Tolerance, la primauté de la raison. And the fact is that today we see in many societies that the only platforms that are available for those that are angry, that feel discriminated, that, uh, that reject the society, the only platforms that are available are either radical Islam or populist xenophobia. And I think it's important that people feel that there are values and principles that are assumed, namely by mainstream political forces, in order to be able to reassure societies that it is possible to have a society that is multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, but live in harmony and create the conditions for a prosperous development of all its components. Sie können gerne klatschen. <laughs> you can give them a hand, you can applaud. <coughs> Now, before going to the public, I would like to uh, come to the uh, security aspect. Uh, we just heard it uh, because of the terrorist attacks in Paris. Uh, uh, everybody feels threatened now. Open borders uh, will always be questioned because of that. Uh, I would like to ask you, Mr. Sorensen, uh, did you feel it in your business, uh, the worry that uh, many people who travel don't even want to go to European large cities? Uh, are they afraid? Or is that the case? Or we hope it isn't. Yes, it's interesting. I'd like to make one comment just on uh, some of the comments that have just been made. The, the, uh, the force that's on the other side of this question whether it be a refugee seeking uh, safety or whether it be somebody seeking asylum formally or somebody migrating for a job, uh, the force on the other side is extraordinarily powerful. A woman who's in a war zone who feels like her th kids are threatened will leave and cross that border, almost no matter what any of us has to say about whether or not they're permitted. Uh, they will run to safety if they feel like they can and they will run ultimately to opportunity. So even when they may try and use the asylum process, many migrants are faced with a circumstance in which they feel like they, and probably factually cannot provide, and they see opportunities somewhere else, in Switzerland, in the United States, and fill in the blank. And those forces are powerful, and, and we will try and erect rules around it, but ultimately those forces will continue to look for a way out. Uh, when you get to travel, I think there the, the force is less powerful, uh, but it is still quite a strong force. If your family lives in another country, uh, you want badly with some regularity to go see them. Uh, if you need to do business, if that's your opportunity, you're going to try and do the same thing. And when a, an event in Paris happens, for example, the immediate response is going to vary a little bit depending on the purpose of that trip. Uh, and to some extent, the, the aspect of threat uh, that uh, seems to be uh, communicated because of the event. The events at Charlie Hebdo were awful, but they were targeted at a newspaper that was doing something specific. It was not a bomb on the metro. It was not a, a generalized terrorist event in Paris. And as a consequence, uh, the impact to travel to Paris because of this probably will not be very significant. May there be a few people who cancel their trip right after that event? Of course there might be. Uh, but, but there's not really much of a connection between that event and what a tourist or what a business traveler or somebody coming to see their family in Paris uh, would connect to that. That's uh, good news. We, yes. we have obviously uh, too much experience around the world with this, yeah. uh, whether it be the events of uh, in New York in 9-11, whether it be events in Jakarta, whether it be events in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, and uh, we, as people, want to move, want to exercise the freedom that we think is a, it should be available to us. And usually, within a relatively short period of time, we are back going to those places to see our families, to do business, uh, and probably rationally concluding that the risk to us simply because an event happened in the past is not that significant. We are yes. resilient people as human beings, I think. Herr Minister, dazu. Herr Minister. Well, 
I would like to say something about the conflict. For instance, Turkey. Turkey is a NATO partner. There are millions of people from Turkey who live in Germany. And there are millions of Germans who <coughs> love to go to Turkey for holiday. There are million people who live in Germany who want to go Germany who want to go back and visit their families. Nobody wants to restrict any movement there. It would be cynical. It would be incredible. Never heard of. If we allow terrorists, because of their attacks, to restrict this kind of travel. And yet we know that several thousand people from Europe go to Syria and Iraq via Turkey to murder and to kill and to uh, support uh, what they call ISIS. Now, where are the restrictions? We need profiling. We must, we must find out who are those who go there and come back in order to uh, participate in terrorist actions, and this is why we need information. And then, of course, we have the conflict between privacy and security, and we have to go through that. But this is the reason for us saying, if we uh, have an agreement with the Americans, the Europeans have an agreement with Americans, so, it, so that the Americans will learn who flies from Germany or uh, France uh, to the US, uh, that uh, the airlines have to give it uh, to the authorities uh, who keep those records for a while and then uh, do them away. It mustn't be wrong for us to give that information to who needs it, not only to the Americans. In other words, we have to weigh both sides. Of course, the safest thing would be if uh, for one year nobody would uh, be allowed to come from Turkey to Europe, but that would be unacceptable. It could not be. Uh, it could not be squared with our values, and you have made the case for our values. The compromise is information and selection. Information. If you don't want neither information nor selection, then we have a safety a security problem. Well, would you have to uh, control the open uh, border between Turkey and Syria? Well, this is difficult uh, to ask for. There are two thousand kilometers uh, of. Uh, border there, physically hardly recognizable, and there I want to say what our Turkish friends uh, say to us. They tell us, you ask us to tell you exactly who is coming and who is flying back uh, out of 3,000 people. Our secret services, our uh, information services are supposed to do that. We have uh, thousands of uh, ref refugees. Uh, we have a huge, a long borderline. We have a very tough time in avoiding terrorist attacks in Turkey. And you want us to uh, take care of 3,000 people? How about your Europeans, dude? Don't even let them leave Europe. And I must say, I can see their point. Mrs. President, uh, a last question to you before I give the public uh, uh, the opportunity to ask questions. Do you fear that uh, the uh, terrorist attacks in Paris and the increased uh, terrorist uh, uh, danger in Europe could menace and could threaten the internal uh, the borders in Europe? Well, I must say, I don't really have anything to add to what Thomas de Maizière just said. This is our dilemma. The same thing goes for Switzerland. It holds for Switzerland and all other European countries. We all have a common external border. And I would say that uh, our task in politics is to remain honest in this discussion, to say honestly what happened in Paris could happen in our country. That doesn't mean that you simply sit there and do nothing and we would like to ask for this not to happen. We have to make sure uh, to do something about it, uh, to uh, prevent it. And uh, M Mr. de Maizière just enumerated a number of things, so that's exactly what we have to do. Switzerland is in the middle of Europe. Europe cannot afford a security gap, which is called Switzerland, which is why we plead for being a part of it. We want to take part in the discussions and want to have a say in decisions to be taken, and we're well understood there. But the next question is, uh, 
what makes people do that? What kind of people would do that type of thing? And there are no simple answers there. We have to be honest there as well. You don't have one profile that simply uh, uh, is applicable, then you immediately pinpoint the terrorists. But there are a set of circumstances that would favor the creation of terrorists. One of the possibilities would be somebody who has no perspective, who suffers from discrimination, who has no chance in life, who uh, does not feel recognized or taken seriously by uh, the society he or she lives in, who uh, has uh, put in a hundred applications for a job and has been turned down a hundred times, who is frustrated. We might say that, well, that there's somebody who gives him or her an identity and uh, their life a sense, and this could be a premise for terrorist activities. But it might be society, a society unable to uh, give any answers uh, or an identity uh, for the sense of life. I asked yesterday, I put the question in my inaugural speech, uh, who are we? What are our values? Those are universal values which should, which should hold for everybody. Let us think about these values. I talked about these uh, questions several times today in my discussions. We must not simply leave this aside. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to ask you to put some questions there. And I mean questions. Please put questions, don't make statements. Good question can be put in 20 seconds, and I'm convinced that you could do that. Please say who you are. If you have a long question or you actually make a statement instead of putting a question, I would like to. I'm going to cut your microphone. Well, with this inviting gesture, I would like to give the floor to this person. I think we should talk about uh, the reasons why people become refugees. We will talk about the consequences. We just said that 15 million uh, refugees, most of them flee for war. Uh, the Pope said uh, 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 refugee policies uh, kills people, but uh, economic policy as well. We don't do enough for refugees. In other, question, in other words, my question is, what can we do so that refugees will have a possibility of uh, have an existence in their own country instead of going around the globe? This is why there will be a demonstration in Davos with refugees at 2 p.m. On Saturday, so that they will tell us why they flee their country, so that they can say it, and we don't speak for them. Es wäre immer noch ganz but it would be nicer who you address this question to, and if you had said who you were. Introduce yourself, please. But please uh, don't make it lengthy. Uh, I'm uh, active in a number of uh, cultural and uh, the war reasons. Uh, the question is put to Mr. Gutierrez and uh, to uh, the interior minister, because you talked about this question. Please answer briefly so that others get the possibility to talk as well. This is our time is that the international community today has a very limited capacity to prevent conflicts and to timely solve them. If you look at the key questions uh, that we face uh, in relation to all of them, the Security Council of the United Nations has been paralyzed. And this is the reality we face. I mean, we live in a world where power relations became unclear, where there is not a global governance system, and uh, where uh, unpredictability and impunity became the name of the game. And so conflicts emerge where, everywhere without any capacity to stop them. Look at South Sudan. South Sudan is a country that became independent just uh, five, six years ago. Um, and two leaders have created the conditions for a civil war that is devastating completely the country and killing thousands and thousands of people and forcing more than one million to move. Now, uh, I remember the, the American Secretary of State, the, 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 the Secretary General of the United Nations, the presidents of all the countries around going there, and nobody is able to stop this. Indeed, the international community today lacks the capacity to stop conflicts and to prevent them effectively. And this is, I think, the major effort that needs to be done. On the other hand, if I may say so, I believe it would be also very important for development cooperation policies to have human mobility in the center of their concerns. And uh, many times, development cooperation policies help to uproot people 
instead of helping to create um, capacity for communities to sustain themselves. And we are witnessing in the developing world a form of urbanization without jobs. That is uh, one of the main reasons why so many people are on the move. Herr de Maizière. Ich habe es ja eben schon ein bisschen gesagt. Sie haben das well, I said so before. You're right uh, in analyzing this. Well, to uh, do away with the reasons for the flight, but that's complicated. Two, com two uh, examples. Libya. We had a dictator, Gaddafi, during the Arab Spring. There are uh, protests. There were protests against his dictatorship. At the same time, there were tribal conflicts. And the West decided, some states, some Western states have decided uh, to save a city where there would have been massacres and decided to bomb that city. Result, there is no more authority in Libya. The tribal conflicts uh, are worse than ever before. And we're talking about uh, the, f uh, the uh, refugees uh, drowning in uh, the Mediterranean. We could talk uh, about the refugees who die of hunger while they go through the Libyan desert because nobody counts them. What was right? To carry out the bombing or was it wrong? And if it was wrong, would it have been better to leave the dictator where he was? And that wasn't a, a question of poverty because there was relatively, there was a lot of oil there. The next question, the next uh, uh, example is Eritrea. Eritrea is among the five or six uh, largest uh, uh, refugees origin country. Very bad dictatorship. And the uh, number of refugees from Eritrea is very high. Now give me a political recipe. How can the West do something for the democratization of Eritrea? There are very complicated conflicts in the country between Ethiopia and Eritrea. And it's not only a question of poverty. And uh, we talked about Sudan before. We thought that the war in Sudan would be ended by creating two uh, states, the southern uh, Christian state and the northern Islamic state. The UN actually managed, and we were actually uh, proud of this type of state building. We uh, spent a lot of money and created a buffer zone uh, with a U UN mandate between two countries in order to stop the war. What was the result? The two states are still at war with each other. And this is why it's easy to say that we should contribute uh, to uh, uh, end the conflicts, but it's very hard to do. Another question? Thank you. I'm Sylvia Grundmann. I'm here with a group uh, of uh, former uh, scholars of the uh, Konrad Adenauer Foundation. My question is addressed to Mr. Demesier. You talked about the Balkan refugees. Germany did a lot. There are a number of uh, old cases, about 7,000 uh, still left over. They are after the, after the winter, a lot of them are returned, uh, many of them to Kosovo. Now, I am concerned with the children in that group, but there's a number of children who only know Germany. They're socialized in Germany. They speak German. They have no future in Kosovo, and I am worried. I'm worried because, for me, these uh, children have a security risk. These children have no chance in the future. There are a lot of young men. What will become of them? Is it smart to handle it like that? Because these are small numbers, a small problem, therefore. You talked about the German population. Uh, the German popu uh, population very often supports this group in the various uh, communities. Well, we're talking about you are talking about a very difficult uh, dilemma. The longer the uh, uh, procedures uh, drag on for children, it becomes clear that, thank God, they are quite well integrated. 
In other words, these children are closer to Germany than they are to Kosovo. One of the reasons, and one of the consequences uh, uh, of uh, these cases uh, uh, is a new uh, law that is in the offering in Germany. Uh, for people who uh, have lived in Germany for eight years can remain there. For children, it's six years. It's the right to remain. On the other hand, on the other hand, you can't really have a premium for delaying a uh, procedure. I said that before. Well, I think there are very various possibilities. I want to be careful in, in drafting. We could say, well, we leave the children here and the parents go back. Well, that contradicts our sense of family. And but for the future and in the integration. Uh, uh, it would not be the worst thing for the children because the parents are very often are not integrated because uh, we didn't let them work uh, so far. We didn't uh, give them any integration courses, uh, but we're changing all this. So basically, uh, we cannot uh, simply avoid this dilemma. In one, at one of the, uh, the forum, rooms today, I said uh, some dilemmas can't be solved, they can only be managed. In other words, we have to manage the situation. These people are present in Germany, and for the future, we will have to make sure that the lengthy procedures uh, will be shortened. But there is one more thing which also holds for Afghanistan. Kosovo, of course, is one of the poorest countries of the world in Europe. No, in Europe. And we know, we're aware of the problems uh, that exist there. There are thousands of soldiers uh, uh, in, uh, from Germany who go there in order to stabilize uh, uh, things uh, locally. And a lot of money is spent on this. So there, a lot of German people don't understand, and I must say I understand them, why if we make sure with soldiers and European po uh, policemen that progress is made uh, in the north of Kosovo. There are 60,000 people. We do a lot for the stabilization of this country. Well, then we should be able to ask people to return to their own country because we do everything in our power to make sure that that country will be stabilized. You cannot say that we cannot make you go back. Why are we in Kosovo then? We ha I think we have to take uh, to take that into consideration as well. Another question? Benjamin Schaff. I'm also from, uh, or uh, I'm a student of the Konrad Adenauer um, Institution. Now, one word that hasn't been mentioned is brain drain or selective uh, emigration. Switzerland uh, has been operating well there. Uh, Germany, perhaps, as well. On the question of whether or not it's fair to let people, the best brains of uh, poorer countries, to come to your countries, should they be um, should they be refused the permission to come? Well, I would also be interested in the view of uh, the High Commissioner on this question because it is an interesting problem. Now we're talking here about migration rather than r refugees. Uh, now every country operates its policy on migration according to its own interests. It looks for migrants who it believes uh, will benefit it. Um, now, I don't know if I should talk about the ca cases of Canada or uh, the US who, who, who do that. Now, there are forces to brain drain on, on both sides. Again, it's a dilemma, a dilemma you can't escape. Uh, Wolfgang Schäuble considered the possibility of temporary migration. Mr. Guterres will know that proposal. I don't believe it can work. But it's a dilemma you can't escape. If you're organizing migration according to your, according to your own interests, then you will try to attract those migrants to Germany or wherever who have a high level of training and that will be other countries' loss. And um, if we're not going to take that approach, then we'd have to close the uh, borders to such people, and that's not what we want to do. But another thing I'd like to say, Mr. Guris talked about um, the questionnaire which mentioned toilet cleaners. 
Uh, it was quite a drastic example, but I could also say, for example, in terms of domestic help, in terms of care, uh, uh, not the case of your mother, Mr. Guterres, which you mentioned, but, for example, um, carers who have to remove uh, the protection or to take off um, the bedclothes of incontinent, the incontinent elderly. Now, many people uh, in the countries we've been talking about and in the developed world would not be happy to do this work. So you have, on the one hand, the brain drain, but you also have this question of the, if you like to call it the exploitation or the use of uh, migrants who are doing work that we don't want to do. So if you like, what you're seeing is a de facto immigration into the lowest wage sector. And that's something that we haven't really openly discussed. Now, part of the population refuses that possibility on, um, on the grounds of the possibility of social unrest, ghettos, um, social dumping, etc. But the fact is that this kind of immigration is going on. It really raises serious questions. Uh, we are seeing that um, there is this clear division of labor in the United States. It's not something, however, we've had a far-reaching discussion about. Uh, so that's not brain drain. It's really the opposite. Yes, perhaps a form of exploitation. Now, now as much as I love the uh, Conrad Adenauer Foundation, I would perhaps like to see somebody else take the floor. Yes, my name is Nashino. I'm a Kurd journalist. We work for the um, Kurd, the, the Kurd media, and I have a question to the Swiss president and the uh, interior minister, de Mezia. Madam President, do you believe that the people who are here in Europe, when it comes to discussing matters at these events where global leaders are present, uh, try to accept other people's perspectives. Now, should Europe, which is a, the, the continent of the Enlightenment, try to contribute to other continents living as peacefully together as Europe? And should we try to remove rejection? Of, of other people's problems. Interior Minister, you've talked about people traveling to Syria and coming back. We are hearing uh, about big figures in Europe of, pe of people doing this, large numbers of people doing this. Um, do you not fear that we might see uh, some kind of repeat of the Charlie Hebdo attacks? Do you not think that if five, 10,000 uh, people who have traveled to Syria come back, that that raises the danger of such attacks. I've heard figures of over 2,500 of these people in Germany. Thank you, Madam President. Yes, of course. Uh, Europe, including Switzerland, has an interest to see peaceful conditions not only in Europe, uh, but in other countries outside Europe. Peace on a long-term basis. We need to contribute, and we are contributing to that. We're doing it through our development assistance. Uh, cooperation in this area means building uh, durable systems in countries. Let me give you an example. We talked about labor migration. We've talked about brain drain. I, interested a very, I visited a very interesting project in Cameroon where Switzerland has long-term uh, cooperation projects. We train or um, further educate and train doctors from Cameroon in Switzerland, and they all return home to Cameroon. So I think the idea that people from the South only want to get to Europe and once they're here, they will stay um, is really not what actually happens. Now, Switzerland 
sends doctors the other way as well. We have doctors from Switzerland going to Cameroon uh, who really learn a great deal. Um, and on an evening where we have to discuss a great deal of suffering, I think it's also very important to discuss the positive example where we're seeing uh, the possibility of a reverse brain drain where we see a genuine contribution to durable systems in other countries. And the other uh, element which really makes a positive contribution is our trade relations and cooperation. Now, this is something that I discussed yesterday as well, because our attitude uh, towards trade and human rights has to see some kind of link there. It's very important to establish um, human rights in countries to ensure that they have freedom of expression, but also trade is an essential element in that. I talked about the trade in commodities yesterday, where I said it's very important that human rights be respected. If we cannot uh, foster trade in such a way that people feel that they can remain in their countries and get work and develop uh, their quality of life and careers, then we will be contributing to situations that might result in crises, wars, and refugees. So we must recognize that we're living in an interconnected world. As Mr. de Maizière has said, it's not easy, but it's certainly worth it. If we want to get to the root of the problems when we're talking about refugees, then development assistance and cooperation is essential, uh, fostering trade ties also absolutely essential. Mr. de Maizière, could we have a short answer, please? Yes. There might be people from Syria who are not politically persecuted, but are actually political persecutors in, amongst the refugees coming to Germany. Um, we, I don't believe that there are uh, terrorists amongst them, but recently uh, a former asylum seeker from Rwanda was sentenced in Germany for having participated in the uh, massacres in Rwanda. And I can understand that there might be um, an official from uh, the regime in Syria who is worrying about his future and will take the chance of going to Germany and uh, seeking asylum. So there might be concerns that amongst the asylum seekers from Syria, there are people who are not politically persecuted. With regard to um, those traveling for purposes of terrorism, we're talking people who have been radicalized at home in Germany. So it's not logical to um, apply disadvantageous procedures to genuine Syrian asylum seekers because people who have been radicalized at home in Germany are traveling to Syria and, and coming home amongst them. Um, I'd like to correct the figure you said, uh, 2,600. We said two, 260 was the actual figure. Uh, 600 people traveled from Germany. Now, that is um, a high figure figure for people traveling to Syria, lower per capita than other countries in Europe. Um, I won't go into that in any greater depth, but we're talking about people coming from Syria who are in their great majority politically uh, persecuted. The fact that there are amongst them people who are not is uh, not a reason for restricting their rights. Thank you very much. We have a question there, uh, the chap with the microphone. Thank you very much. I'm also from the Konrad Adenauer Sh Foundation. I'm sorry, I should have guessed, says the chairman. I have a question to um, the president and the interior minister. What are you doing to counter the s smuggling crimes that we're seeing? Well, that's an issue of central importance, and I have a very bad conscience about this because I believe we're not doing enough. The revenues, uh, the profits of the 
um, smugglers is estimated to be between five and six billion. I don't know if that's right, Mr. Guterres. It's a figure from the UN. Um, I can only give that, pass that figure on. Uh, we have uh, smugglers in our own country, on a, on the, uh, but these are these are small uh, smugglers. We have many different uh, bodies who are trying to get a grip uh, on this problem. We have cooperation, but we need more cooperation in, with Libya, uh, with um, Egypt. Uh, we need to also work on the links in the chain, for example, in Turkey. It's extremely complicated, and it's easier to say than do. Thank you very much. We've talked about immigration. We've talked about political refugees and economic uh, migration, but we haven't really talked about um, immigration within the EU. Mr. de Mazier, you said that uh, in Germany benefits are higher than wages in Romania. So uh, recently there was a decision that a young man from Nuremberg who came to um, Germany not wishing to work but wishing to seek benefits, um, he, it was deemed that he was allowed to do that by the court. So the question is to what extent is that allowable? How can, um, how can that happen and how long can it be allowed to happen? I don't know really whether that belongs to, to the uh, discussion this evening. We have freedom of movement in the European Union uh, for the establishing of enterprise and the seeking of work, not uh, some kind of benefit tourism. So these are the rules. These are the rules that can be applied and I don't think we should make too many problems out of it. Um, Germany really benefits from this freedom of movement. And in Germany, we really do benefit from it. If you look at our hospitals, um, we get very well trained uh, nurses from Spain and Portugal where there is an unemployment rate of 20 and 30 percent of Spain and Portugal, um, you have to ask the question of whether they are benefiting, but certainly Germany is benefiting from uh, the application of the freedom of movement. We have economic migration. Um, that certainly um, is taking place. And as you know, over the recent years, we have been working on this. It's a regional issue. Um, it affects at Dortmund, Offenbach, Mannheim, and other towns in Germany. We have addressed these problems. We have to identify abuses. Uh, but essentially, the use of the freedom of movement rules from Bulgaria and Romania is not an abuse. If we um, put aside certain issues, which I can't go into now because of the lack of time, it's not something that we really need to worry about. Um, there are concerns in terms of brain drain, but we need uh, doctors in Germany. And um, we have many Romanian and Bulgarian doctors. The system in Romania is facing difficulties because of that. Um, but the rule of freedom of movement exists. Uh, there are funds and resources available in Bulgaria to counter these problems. So the prosperity gap is bigger than ever with the much larger European Union, much greater than it was when there were six members of the European Union. Um, but the, um, we don't want to do away with the principle of freedom of movement. So, ladies and gentlemen, just to remind you, this was the Open Forum rather than a Conrad Adenauer Foundation-sponsored event. And I would like to thank the World Economic Forum for having organized it. Thank you, President. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you to, um, and to your Antonio Guterres and Arne Sorensen. Thank you very much for coming.